So for the next part, let's talk about statins. Statin medications. We've all heard of statin medications. If you're not on a statin, you will know somebody who's on a statin medication. They are everywhere. And the reason why so many people are on statins nowadays goes back to the last century, the middle of the last century, which got us to the lipid cholesterol hypothesis of heart disease. Now, I've already talked about a lot of these different factors, but it's worth recapping here on all of them, all of these different things that came together to make everybody think that, yes, we have to aggressively target cholesterol to lower heart disease. So remember, we had Ansel Keys, who, in my opinion, is one of the most controversial characters in medicine from the last century. We had President Eisenhower, who had his heart attack and a lot of public attention was then focused on heart disease. We had the American Heart Association, which went from a fledgling organization to a million dollar organization because a company called Procter and Gamble sponsored them. And that went on to shape a lot of their policies. And of course, we had the dodgy, shady research from the Sugar Research Foundation and their link with Harvard scientists and the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's terrible when you think about it. These are supposed to be trusted institutions. Harvard University, the New England Journal of Medicine. But when you dive into the history, there are a lot of questions to be asked. But anyway, all of these factors came together to make people think that the culprit for heart disease was dietary fat. It was not sugar. It was not excessive carbohydrates. It was not processed food. Obviously, processed food consumption has gone up a lot over the last few decades since the 1950s and 60s. But we are where we are. And the interesting thing is this. I can guarantee you that over 90%, maybe over 95% of physicians out there have no idea about the things that I just talked about. Ansel Keys, the American Heart Association history, the Sugar Research Foundation, President Eisenhower. And this is an invitation, actually, if this video ends up being posted, any academic institution out there that wants me to come and speak to your future doctors, students, or whoever, I'm happy to do so about all of these factors. I will educate you on the real history. I'm not holding my breath. I don't think they will. But anyway, it's an open invitation if you want me to talk about that. So let's talk about what happened. When it was decided that, yes, cholesterol was causing heart disease, there was a rush to produce some drugs to lower cholesterol. So the first drug that came out was called Triparanol in the 1960s. And it was an unmitigated disaster. Had a ton of side effects, caused conditions including accelerated irreversible cataracts, and it was withdrawn from the market. I don't think many people know that in the medical field either. The first statin to be released was Lovastatin in 1987. Now we're at a situation where over 200 million people in the world are on statins. Tens of millions of people in the United States, United Kingdom, and atorvastatin, Lipitor, is one of the highest selling drugs of all time. Let's talk a little bit about the statin industry. Let's start with Lipitor, because it was introduced by Pfizer back in 1997, and it's one of the top three selling medications of all time. And I'll quote you something here. Until 2021, the cholesterol-lowering drug industry aggregated lifetime sales of over $163 billion. We're talking about more than the entire GDP of whole countries. This is staggering, and it's growing significantly by billions of dollars every single year. The annual global market for statins was $15 billion, $15 billion in 2021, and is projected to reach well over $20 billion by the 2030s. Remember, a lot of these drugs are no longer under patent. They have become generic, so the cost has decreased. But again, one of the most lucrative selling drug classes, maybe even the most lucrative selling drug class in history. The medical establishments all over the world, not just in the United States, but all over the world, are obsessed with statins. There have been some medical leaders, believe it or not, 
who suggest that statins should be added to drinking water. I kid you not. But of course, like any medication, therapeutic, they come with side effects. And I want to talk about some of the frequent side effects here. The most well-known, muscle aches, muscle breakdown. A lot of people suffer with muscular problems after taking statins. We'll go over some statistics in a moment. Fatigue, dizziness, gastrointestinal complaints, elevation in liver function tests. There have even been reports about statins causing mood disorders, psychiatric issues. And I want to quote you something here from the British Medical Journal that was published. Statin use and risk of developing diabetes results from the Diabetes Prevention Program. Their conclusion was that in the population studied at high risk for diabetes, we observed significantly higher rates of diabetes with statin therapy in all three treatment groups. Confounding by indication for statin use does not appear to explain this relationship. The effect of statins to increase diabetes risk appears to extend to populations at high risk for diabetes. That's quite concerning. And how about some more recent information on side effects? Well, let me quote you something here from Up to Date, which is the go-to resource for clinicians in the United States for latest evidence-based medicine. Take a listen to this. They said here that in clinical practice, side effects with statins are common, which could be related in part to a heightened awareness of adverse reactions traditionally attributed to the drug and treatment in patients with comorbidities that were often excluded from clinical trials. That seems like an interesting thing to say. So what am I saying and what am I not saying? What I'm saying is that we have a very obvious blockbuster drug that is dished out like candy nowadays. And we should be thinking about the true benefits in more detail. We should be more scientific and looking at real data. And I'm going to share some evidence with you in a moment. I am not saying that everybody who's on a statin medication should stop it. Indeed, it goes without saying, always speak to your own doctor before making any changes. But that doctor should be able to discuss the real benefits with you but never stop any medication yourself until you've had that discussion. The reality is that we're in a situation where we're almost mindlessly prescribing statins. Like many other drugs, actually, doctors are following protocol. Doctors in our current system have become protocol followers. I have seen situations where an elderly person, very elderly in their 90s, might have a stroke or a heart attack, and the overall philosophy of care is to keep the patient as comfortable as possible. We don't want to be too aggressive. We can certainly give them some medications, but nothing which is too aggressive. But I have seen patients like this in their 90s with heart attacks and strokes get put on high-dose statins. What is the evidence behind that, and why are doctors mindlessly ticking boxes? We have to think about this in more detail. Because yes, Statins will work to reduce your LDL, quote, bad cholesterol. They will do that. That's what they're designed to do. But the question is, what are the true clinical benefits of that? I could come along to your house with a bucket of red paint, and I use the red paint, and yes, your house will be covered in red paint. It will look red. But what have I achieved by doing that? What was I trying to do in the first place? That is the question that real people of medicine and science should be asking before falling into the trap of mindlessly following protocols. It's a logic fail if you don't ask the right questions. And all the while, these corporations are making billions and billions of dollars. Think about what's happening here. I'd like to touch upon a few other points. Firstly, there's a very big difference between primary and secondary prevention. What do I mean by this? Primary prevention is when you give a medication with the intention of stopping someone from having something happen to them, like a heart attack or a stroke. Secondary prevention is when you give someone a medication after they've already had something happen to them to lower their risk further. So they may have a heart attack or a stroke, and then you give them a medication. Most people who are on statins, the vast majority, have not had anything happen to them yet. And of course, we have to talk about, I've talked about this before, absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. Two crucial concepts. Let me share something with you here 
that was published online that really gives us more of a perspective of what we're talking about when we're analyzing the true benefits of statins. So here we go. Statins, which have become synonymous with heart attack and stroke preventing, have an NNT, that means number needed to treat, of 60 for heart attack and 268 for stroke. That's how many healthy people have to take statins for five years for those respective outcomes to be prevented. So you got that? 60 people have to take it for five years to prevent a heart attack. That means it wouldn't work for 59 people. And 268 for stroke. That means for 267 people it wouldn't work, but for one person it would. In people with heart disease already, that's secondary prevention, remember, the number is smaller. Just 39 must take statins for five years for one non-fatal heart attack to be prevented, while 83 have to do so for one life to be saved. There's still many people who would think that those odds are not particularly good either, but they are better than for primary prevention. And how about the actual number in terms of mortality benefits? There have been some studies which show that if people take statins religiously for several years, then the mortality benefit might only be measurable in days. You got that? Just days. That's it. Let me share another very interesting article here from 2015. How statistical deception created the appearance that statins are safe and effective in primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. We have provided a critical assessment of research on the reduction of cholesterol levels by statin treatment to reduce cardiovascular disease. Our opinion is that although statins are effective at reducing cholesterol levels, like I said, they will reduce your LDL cholesterol especially, they have failed to substantially improve cardiovascular outcomes. We have described the deceptive approach statin advocates have deployed to create the appearance that cholesterol reduction results in an impressive reduction in cardiovascular disease outcomes through their use of a statistical tool called relative risk reduction, a method which amplifies the trivial beneficial effects of statins. We have also described how the directors of the clinical trials have succeeded in minimizing the significance of the numerous adverse effects of statin treatment. This article did actually produce some headlines like this one. Safety, life-saving efficacy of statins have been exaggerated, says scientist. So I cannot emphasize that point enough. The difference between absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. Because pharmaceutical companies, big industry, they love using relative risk reduction because it tends to greatly exaggerate the benefit of any particular intervention, whatever that intervention is. So let me give you an example. A disease might occur in two out of every hundred people. And you give a hundred people an intervention, a medication, a therapeutic, something else. And after the study period, the risk of disease goes down from two people in a hundred to one in every hundred. So that is a relative risk reduction of 50%. So the media headlines, the pharmaceutical headlines will all be, look at this intervention, reduced the risk by 50%. But what the correct thing to do should be, take a step back, hold on a minute, 98 out of every 100 people were not affected in the first place. Is this really a justification to give the medication to absolutely everyone? Or can we be more targeted? Because the absolute risk reduction is much less. You've gone from 2 to 1%, so only 1%. You see the difference between absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction? But it's crucial to ask these questions whenever you're seeing a study result, and not enough people high up in medicine do that. And of course, if you ask questions, if you bring up these points, what happens? You are labeled a cholesterol denier. You're not allowed to ask any questions raise any concerns whatsoever, you must follow protocol. And this playbook goes right back to the turn of the last century. Remember we talked about Rockefeller and Flexner? This is right out of the playbook. Label anyone who asks questions, who raises concerns, label them a denier, in this case a cholesterol denier. You're a quack. You can't do that. You can't ask questions, but it's a well-known playbook. Do not fall for it. The system, the establishment, whatever you want to call it, we're in a situation right now where the system is basically set up to make a lot of people very sick, primarily through toxic pro-inflammatory foods, all of those foods found in the middle aisles of grocery stores. 
People unfortunately get very sick. Nowadays, the main danger is ultra processed foods and sugars. People get sick and then big pharmaceutical companies have an answer. They have a product to help, but nobody actually addresses the true root causes. So people get sick and they are a customer for life. This is the situation that we're in right now. So what would be the conclusions here about statins? Well, again, I can't emphasize enough. Obviously, if you're on a statin or someone you know is on a statin, don't just stop the medication yourself, but you should have a real discussion with your doctor. Because here's what I would do. Here's what I do. I would say, this is the evidence. If you, in your particular demographic, take the statin, this will be the real benefit you will achieve if you take it for however long, many years. However, as a doctor myself, whose primary area of interest is lifestyle medicine and metabolic health, I will always extend that discussion, and that doesn't happen enough. And I will say to people, well, you can take this medicine, and these are the small percentage improvements. Here's what you can do. Yes, you can take the pill, or you can initiate lifestyle change, which is absolutely unbeatable. It's always number one. You can eat a real food diet, you can eliminate ultra-processed fake foods, sugars. You can do other things. Eat a bowl of blueberries every day. Cut back on carbs. Eat a bowl of spinach. There's so many things out there that will produce fantastic benefits. But if you initiate those lifestyle changes, then your benefits will be magnitudes greater. I'm talking about huge percentage differences in improvement over just taking a statin. So I know what I would do if I was presented with that option. I would say personally, no thank you to the statin. I will achieve it through lifestyle measures, which is very achievable most of the time. And I think if a lot of patients had that discussion, especially in the United States where you're going to be put on a medication which is costly, at least doctors would be doing their best to educate patients on the true benefits of medications versus lifestyle intervention. And of course, lifestyle intervention is harder. It takes effort. But I think if more doctors actually did that sincerely and said, you will have a much greater benefit with other side benefits as well. You'll lose weight. Other things will happen. Inflammation will be reduced. But doing that is far better than taking a medication. But the choice is yours. You can do other things. You can exercise daily. I know what my choice would be anyway. Perhaps that's just me. But I would not be interested personally in a statin medication without really going for those lifestyle changes. And I know which one is much more beneficial to my health. And that's the great paradox of where we are right now as of 2023 in healthcare with our pharmacological focused mindset. So if you're out there, if you're on a statin or you know anyone on a statin, or if you've had side effects to a statin and you have some doubts, what I'd encourage you to do is go to your doctor, sit down, have that one-on-one -on -one discussion and say, doctor, hopefully your doctor will know this, say in my demographic, I want you to tell me what the true benefits of this medication I am taking are. Pull up some data. Tell me what my percentage improvements are. Do I really need this medication? And are there other things that I can do that will have way higher benefits so that you can make the correct informed decision, whatever that may be. It's all about patient autonomy, informed consent. You can only make your decision when you're presented with the true facts of any medical therapeutic. Thanks everyone for listening.